garage? There we go. Okay. Yep. Okay. The question, how could God let that happen, is a pretty common one. I hear it pretty regularly. It comes in all sorts of different permutations. How could God let this happen to me? Uh, God would never let that happen. Or why would God let this happen to me? And there's all sorts of permutations to this question. Now, here's a, here's a face that many of you will remember, Dottie Harrington. Dottie, um, whenever someone would say something like, why, how could God let this happen to me? Daddy, Dottie would usually retort back to them, why not you? <laughs> People would sort of be surprised. And, you know, Dottie, well, along with just about anybody who survives in this world for a while, she had some hard things in her life too. And she always saw this question as sort of a thing about self-pity because the strange thing about this world is, in fact, people ask this question at all. Because if you pay any attention to anything in this world, life is hard. And even just this morning, you know, all the names of departed loved ones. Now, I know you come into church today and you look around and people are nicely dressed and they're, they're seated nicely in the chair. But as a pastor, you get to hear stories, and hard things happen. It's a rather surprising thing at all that anyone would imagine that life would be easy if you just look around, or maybe if you're watching television all the time and you see beautiful people and wonderful stories and everything is tied in a knot after a half hour, an hour, or two hours. But if you pay any attention to this world, well, none of us get out of here alive. Now, the ancient pagans knew this because none of them would have expected that anything but chaos and bad things would happen because they happen to everyone. Now, some people seem to be fortunate and seem to have better circumstances or worse circumstances, but the gods, well, just read Greek mythology. The gods are chaotic, and they're spiteful, and they're petty, and sometimes they play around with us. In fact, when you went to school, you probably read the Odyssey. Odysseus is, is kind of the, the guy who would say, well, if you want to get what you want out of this life, you have to be clever, and you have to cheat, and you have to lie, and one way or another, maybe you'll get over and get what you want. That's what the pagans thought. It wasn't until you start reading the Bible that you get the idea that God, in fact, wants good things for his people. All the way back to the Exodus, down through the ages, Israel was told, you're special. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And if you read the Bible, if you read, let's say, the book of Deuteronomy, and you go to the last chapters, God is very clear. Here's a whole list of ways that I will bless you if you keep my covenant, and a whole list of ways that I will curse you if you fail my covenant. Now, most of us would sort of like that because when we're offered that, we kind of feel in control. And so when we say, well, God would never let anything bad happen to me, we're also kind of sneaking in, I'm a good person. And Bad things don't happen to good persons, or bad things shouldn't happen to good persons. And if I do everything right, then the whole world will line up as I want. Well, there's always two problems to that. Many people do lots of things right, and bad things happen. And many people do lots of bad things and seem to gain from it. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll see that this is not a secret to any of the people who wrote the Bible. The Psalms are full of complaints. 
The Old Testament prophets look around and Israel, poor little Israel, is struggling under the heels of, of pagan empires. And they say, Lord, why are we not on top if we're so good? But then there's the second question of, well, just how good are we really? Because when we look around, we tend to think, well, my sins are excusable, but the things done against me, they should pay. Now, Andrew Clavin is an author, and he grew up in a nominal, secular Jewish household and became a Christian quite a bit later in life, but he and his brother would sort of joke about being God's chosen people, because when you look at the history of the Jews, well, if they're chosen for anything, they seem to be chosen to suffer. And so Andrew Clavin's brother said this to him once, the reason the Jews are God's chosen people was because no one would volunteer. And, um, and sometimes Jews have quipped, you know, why didn't he choose somebody else? Because to be chosen seems to be a complex thing. I really like the way Clavin sort of summarized the role of biblical Israel with respect to the whole world. They are the theater in which God plays out his relationship with mankind. Now theater is something that sort of happens on a stage. And so to sort of get a sense of God and the rest of us, the Bible takes a look at Israel and says, watch this small model and see if you can figure out the patterns and the relationships. Now, the Bible begins in Genesis 1, and it's kind of hard for us to notice this because there's no building in Genesis 1. But Genesis 1 is a temple text, because what happens in Genesis 1 is that God organizes the world in a good and productive way, in a fruitful, productive way, and at the end of each step, God declares it is good. And that's basically, in the ancient world, the function of temples. And in Genesis 2, temples would usually have gardens, Palaces and temples are closely related because palaces are where kings live and temples are where gods live. And if you go to the, the palace of Versailles, there's this beautiful garden behind it. Ancient temples would have, or ancient palaces would have animals and trees and all sorts of things from all around the world. And so Genesis 1 is sort of the temple of a productive world and Genesis 2 is the garden. And well, gardens need gardeners, and so the man and the woman are in the garden with the animals and the trees and all of these things. And it's good. But then, of course, comes Genesis 3. And into the garden comes a serpent. And that serpent has a question. How could God withhold the fruit of this tree from you? And the woman says, well, we could treat from, eat from any tree but this one. And then the serpent says, well, what's behind this really? And, and the serpent basically suggests that, well, this God doesn't really want what's best for you. He's holding out on you. And you should sort of, like Odysseus, figure out a way to secure it and to take it. And so the woman looks and says, looks good. And she takes some and gives it to Adam. And he takes some. And now what's funny is that every time we cry out, how could God let this happen to me? Well, what did the tree offer? The knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's many of you here sitting in this, these chairs that would probably say, I wish I didn't know evil. I wish I never felt its bite. I wish I never felt its sting. And it's one thing when that evil is out there and the evils people do to me. But the really hard thing is the evils I do to others. They're doing all this work on trauma these days. And they talk about, you know, in the World War I, and they had shell shock. And I don't remember what they called it during the American Civil War, 
But now when soldiers come back from combat, they have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, because we have these long words, and so we compress them down into letters. And in all the studying of that, what they've learned was that it's not really the evil that's done to us that really messes us up inside. You know what it often is? The evil we do to others. Because we like to think bad is what other people do. It's not what I do. I'm a good person. So then when we catch ourselves doing wrong to someone else, oh. So, Adam and Eve, do you really want to know good and evil? Well, if you've never known evil, you say, well, why not? And then you know it. Oh, and you can't unknow it. Now, the story of Israel, the Bible has this long relationship between God and his people. And again, Israel is the theater of God's relationship with all of humanity. Just like in some ways, Odysseus is the prototypical man, while well, Israel is the prototypical character. And last week we talked about Jerusalem sort of not just being a city, but a character. So the Bible is a long history of a relationship. God chooses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God rescues Israel from Egypt. God called Israel into a covenant, and Israel said, yes, we'll keep it. But how many times haven't each of us said, yes, we'll do this thing? You know, we're, I've, I've got a reference to The Bachelor, this movie, this TV show on, on ABC, and I watch the show and they're all like, yes, I'll love you till the day I die. And the camera's there and they've got the ocean background and all of this, and then, well, we all know what percentage of these bachelors and bachelorettes actually even just really make it to the altar, not to mention go the distance with each other. We like to say, I'll do this, and then we can't, or we don't, or we won't, we taste evil. So God was looking for a way for a holy God to redeem, restore, renew, and live with a people who had rebelled against him. The hypercatechism says, I have a natural tendency to hate God and my neighbor. And I think that's really true. It's certainly true of me. And uh, just looking around and watching others, I would say, yeah, that's probably, probably me. Now, temples, again, are important fixtures. Because just like Israel is a theater for God's relationship with all of humanity, temples are a theater by which the relationship is transacted. And so, of course, in the desert wanderings, there's a temple, and then David brings the tabernacle, the tabernacle, David brings the tabernacle into Jerusalem, unto, up onto the mountain, and then David's son Solomon builds the temple. And, well, the sacrifices and all of the fixtures of the temple. This is sort of the theater in which we play with these objects, in which we rehearse the creation and the goodness of creation. And in the ancient world, well, all around the world, if you want your crops to grow, if you want your wives to have children, if you want your animals to, to, to bear fruit, to have other animals, if you want your flocks to multiply, you need to have a temple because that's where it all comes together, like in Genesis 1. But then Israel, having the temple, begins to say, God won't let anything happen to us because we have the temple. We're sort of playing chicken with God. You really don't want to play chicken with God. Why? Because God wins every time. <laughs> and you can't manipulate God by imagining he won't sacrifice something precious of his own. 
for the sake of this mission that he's on. And so when Israel said, we can do what we want, we have the temple, God says, watch me. And the Babylonians come in and destroy it. And Israel says, this was, this was never supposed to happen. How could God let this happen? And of course, if you read the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, those books are written precisely to say how God could let this happen. And the reason was, all the way back to Deuteronomy, Israel that said, we'll do it, I do. And then they didn't. Human failure. So a second temple gets built when Israel comes back from the Babylonian captivity under the Persians. And then the temple gets renovated under Herod the Great. We've talked about that in the last few weeks. But now, as we noted, the temple isn't just a representation. It's a theater. It's a scale model. If you go to the Bay Area, if you go to Sausalito, Maury tipped me off on this when I moved here. If you go to Sausalito, there's the Bay Area model. And it's this really cool building where you have San Francisco and you have the area around it. You have the Golden Gate. Um, you, go, you have the Bay and then you have, the, you have this whole water system that is the Bay. And they run the tides in and out of this thing. And, I remember going that and thinking, well, why did they build that? Well, they didn't have computer models. And so what they did was they built this big model and have it all accurate in terms of all the elevation and they'd run water through it. And I thought, well, why were they trying to do that? Well, someone had the thought that all of this wonderful water that we have, we should store it. And you know the easiest way to store it? If you just dam up that golden gate there, you keep all this water. And someone said, well, that would be a crazy thing to do. Well, the Dutch did it. The Zuider Zee in the Netherlands used to be a salt water inland sea, and now it's all fresh water because they dammed it up to keep all that water in your So you build a model, and so a temple is a model. And we saw this a couple of weeks ago. When the pilgrims went up to the temple, they were walking into this model, and they were about to to participate in the transactions between heaven and earth that kept the crops growing and kept the animals producing and kept the relationships in good order. The whole of reality was somehow condensed into this special space. It was a microcosm of the entire universe. This was Josephus, who had been a priest. He was remembering it. The court of the Gentiles was like the great sea, and the holy place had elements in it that related to the world. The, the curtain on the temple symbolized the four elements and the whole vista of the heavens and the lamps were the seven planets and the showbread were the showbread was the zodiac and the incense altar was all of the stuff habited and uninhabited of the world. The temple worked on all of this. Now, there's going to be some spoilers for The Bachelor here. Joey picked Kelsey. Now, Kelsey was from New Orleans, and if you know anything about The Bachelor, you know, it's a big moment to sort of reveal where The Bachelor is standing there, and these limousines come out, and you first get to see the women that come out, and they all have this little trick to try to be remembered by. And Kelsey from New Orleans comes out with a little voodoo doll. And now, of course, you have all these imaginations in America. Well, he should have been a little nervous because instead of sticking pins in the voodoo doll, she kissed the voodoo doll and she'll, well, maybe this will mean that Joey picks me. And Joey did pick her. So the little voodoo doll is sort of like a smaller representation of the whole. And that's kind of the way that temples throughout the world worked or were thought of, just like that little, tiny little representation. So hopefully, if the relationship goes well, that voodoo doll will stay in good shape. If it goes badly, she might get some pins. We'll see what happens. Last week was Palm Sunday. 
And we saw that Jesus announces the end of the temple. And Jesus points to a new house of God, one not made by hands. A temple, a new house of God made up not of stones like the disciples were looking at, but living stones. A new temple made up by us. And many of you grew up knowing that the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people. And that you all are the living stones and you all are the temple of God and God's spirit rests on you and among you. Now they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law came together and the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death but they did not find any because the kind of evidence you look for is Jesus is trying to start an insurrection and of course as we spoke about in previous weeks everybody good many people wanted Jesus to start an insurrection and because he refused to do it, they were kind of confused by him. But there was no evidence Jesus was trying to start an insurrection. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements didn't agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Well, that's interesting. Jesus never said, I'm going to tear down that building. But Jesus did curse the fig tree. And Jesus was basically saying, the building and this function is coming to an end. And a new one, not made with human hands, will replace it. Even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him. And they blindfolded him. And they struck him with their fists. And said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Now what's interesting is that he didn't fight back. And we don't hear him say, why, why would God let this happen to me? Strange story. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charges against him, the king of the Jews. Pilate was having fun with those who put him up to this. Yet, at the same time, like all of this language about the temple, it's also weirdly true. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left, people who really were trying to overthrow the Roman occupation. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. Now, anybody know where old Hangtown is? Yeah. Why is Placerville called old Hangtown? Last place in California where they did a hanging. Now, some people are old enough to remember that. You know what would happen when there'd be a public hanging? Everybody's gonna come out to see it, especially the kids. Mama's be like, I don't want you seeing that. I wanna go see the hanging. At crucifixion, same thing. People have sport, people make fun. When people get vulnerable, other people want to take advantage. So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. 
In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. This miracle worker, this powerful man, this one who was supposed to change the world, look at him hanging naked on a cross. What a fool. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that, he, that we may see and believe. Those crucified him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He asked the question. That question. How could God let this happen to me? But in Jesus' case, he really was innocent. He really didn't do anything wrong. And of course, it wasn't something distant, something abstract. It was his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? not a bad question. It's just everything around a question we should pay attention to. Remember how Jeremiah, they couldn't use God's temple against him and his mission? Remember the lengths to which God will go. That's why you don't play chicken with God. The lengths to which God will go to get what he wants. What won't God give? To undo what happened with the man and the woman who wanted to know good and evil. What lengths won't God go to? Why would Jesus' death impact the configuration of the temple? It's a funny little bit of the story. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now again, remember what the temple was. It's sort of like the Bay Area model in Sausalito. It's sort of like Kelsey's little voodoo doll. Why would something happen in the temple when Jesus died? What, is temp what are temples about? Sacrifices and animals and death. We look at a pretty building and we think, ooh, it's nice with gold and stuff. If you were to walk up to the temple, you'd say, this is horrible. That's, the place smells of rotten flesh. There's dried blood all over the altar. They're, they're killing animals. I joked a number of weeks ago that if we were to construct an altar here on the little green area in front of church and take some goats and start slicing their throats and throwing blood on the altar. Someone would call the city of Sacramento and say, you, you got to get down here. And, you know, if, if I would have a good lawyer that would say, hey, there's no law against doing that, the city of Sacramento would write one. Because the temple is, on one hand, a place of beauty, but on the other hand, it's a place of death. Jesus cries out, dies, and the curtain is torn. And that means something. Now suddenly, the temple can't function. Jesus is sort of like a Babylonian army. In 586 BC, that destroys the temple. He's sort of like a Roman army, which in 70 would destroy the temple, but he doesn't take down the building function is lost. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. And if you remember, three times Jesus told his disciples who couldn't imagine anything like this would happen, and it was the last thing they'd ever want to happen, and Peter says, surely, Lord, I won't allow this to happen. Jesus always ended it with, and three days later, he will rise from the dead. 
the Son of Man. And of course, there's no banner, there's no party outside the tomb saying, welcome back, Jesus. You told us it was going to happen. Hey, look, it happened. You were arrested. You were flogged. You were killed. Maybe the last little part will happen. Any banner? Disciples? Anyone? When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' presumably dead body. Very early on the first day of the week. Sunday's the first day of the week, by the way. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they were very practical. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Because they're just a group of women. And usually the men do that heavy lifting. But they're going to go anyway and see what they can do. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. What's going on here? And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. First they're alarmed that the stone is rolled away, and now they're alarmed. They come in the tomb, and there's this young dude dressed in white sitting there like, oh, la, la, la. <laughs> Apparently he heard what Jesus said, registered in his mind. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, because they're not here either. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Now trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb. Now this is exactly what you would imagine, given everything that they know. They're, you know, they, they're, their master, their follower, their leader, the, all they hoped that they had, all everything that they had invested in him came to this horrible conclusion on Friday afternoon, and they weren't able to give him a proper burial, so he's our friend. Let's go and do it right after the Sabbath. And they find this. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, this is where the story in Mark gets a little funny. Because if you open your Bible and you see this, you'll notice that the text gets different. Because in the oldest and best manuscripts we have, this is where the book ends. And everybody reading the book would say, this isn't where the book should end. But now in the ancient world, you had scrolls, and everybody also knew that depending on how the scroll was rolled up, the part on the end of the scroll, better treat the scroll well, because if you keep handling that thing, it falls off and you lose it. And so a good many scholars believe that, in fact, we've lost the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. And in the ancient world, people would copy things, and the copiers would get to the end, and they'd say, this can't be right. And so they would take the rest of the story, drawn from other sources, and fill it in. And so that's why, if you open your Bible, you'll see... After Mark 8, you get this more story. It might be in italics or something else. And this is often called the longer ending to the Gospel of Mark. There's all kinds of debates about it. But it's actually a very interesting thing. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping, and when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Which is, again, exactly what you would expect. <laughs> this woman comes back from the tomb and says, Jesus is alive. 
And they say, no, Romans know how to kill people. <laughs> we saw they crucified him. And Joseph of Arimathea got the, the tomb and they put him in there. We all know this. Mary, you're not well. You used to be demon possessed. You were a little crazy back then. We understand grief. It's not right. But afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. Oh yeah, that's that road to Emmaus story. You can find that in the Gospel of Luke. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. What's fun about this ending is we don't know how much other information that isn't in the other Gospels is in here because real life is big and what gets recorded is small. Later appearing to the 11 as they were eating. Oh, we find this in the other Gospels too. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Why did you think Mary Magdalene was lying to you? Come on, guys. You didn't believe her? Why not? You should have believed her. He told you the truth, but they didn't. It's all very real. This is how we are. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Oh, there's the Great Commission, find at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands. That one will get funny in America. Um, and they will drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. And they will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. This is just kind of an accumulation of stories from Paul and the book of Acts. Kind of what, just put all the little stories in to finish the book so it would end nicely. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken out into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Oh, that's like the Apostles' Creed. There it is. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. Just if you're used to reading the rest of the Bible, the Apostles' Creed, and very early church documents. It just reads like all the rest of them. But here we still are. I, it was funny because I remember talking to one skeptic once who was like, he was really unsure about the whole resurrection thing, but then he was like, and even if it happened, so what? So what? And Dottie's observations about life are true. If you're walking around this world thinking, oh, because I'm a Christian, I won't get cancer. Oh, I got some bad news for you. Oh, because I'm a Christian, you know, bad things won't happen to me or my children. Well, I got bad news for you too. But you know what the worst is? If you walk around thinking, because I'm a Christian, I won't do wrong. I got really bad news for you. I don't know expectations. We all know how the world is. The crazy thing is believing that God is good. How can that be? What does good look like? Now the whole chosen thing is interesting because it's not a bad idea to try to be chosen. It sounds crazy, but that's kind of right. Biblical Israel they are the theater in which God plays out his relationship with humankind. And if you understand this whole temple story from Genesis 1 to the tabernacle to the temple and Jesus and all the times that, that this temple shows up in this story, which most of the time we just sort of glance over because we're not paying attention to it, it all actually holds together because Israel tried to do what's right and make their way to God and just couldn't do it. So God comes to them and says, I'm going to be made a human being. I'm going to come in and I'm going to do your side for you. Because you can't. Misery, deliverance, 
Jesus is tied to the temple. They function alike. And that Jesus becomes the nexus point between the creator God and all of humanity. Now when difficult things come, the question is, what is the larger context? Well, we do live in a fallen world. And Christians do get cancer. And calamity does happen to Christians. And Christians do do wrong. What is the larger context in which you see your suffering? That's not a bad thing to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We usually do it for stuff a lot less than Jesus suffered. But it's natural. It comes out. Because we believe that God must have good things for me. And it's sometimes hard to understand. But that's why this whole story is given, to put it all together. Do you believe there's a bigger story at work? That's hard sometimes. Do you believe there is a God who will risk big and pay big to achieve what he wants? That's what's right at the middle of the story. And here it is. Do you want to participate in the drama? Now, we don't have an altar on Florham Road. We don't do sacrifices. Well, what are we doing? We're playing out the drama this morning. We're remembering it. We're rehearsing it. We're, 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 we're seeing all the actors play in this theater. And together, we're professing and trying to believe at one level or another that all of the ups and downs of this world are part of God's plan. And what he's achieving with it is good. All the way up to the naming we did earlier in the service. Can I really believe I'll see Hiram and Grace again? Can I really believe I'll see Henry and Elsie again? Can I really believe I'll see Stan and Lori again. Why would God let these bad things happen? I can't answer all the little questions, but I do believe that a God that would work this hard and commit so much that we saw in this little drama of Jesus, maybe, but maybe, this is a God I can trust. Maybe, but maybe, this is a God I should listen to. Maybe, but maybe, this is a God I should follow. You know, the ancients weren't wrong about the ubiquity of suffering. No, they, they, they were smart. They watched the rest of the world. And today, we've got all kinds of new paganisms all over the place. The foolishness seems to imagine that, well, somehow I can do something and... Calamity won't happen to me. Well, I've not seen it yet. But all those ancient pagans became Christians. Why? Because eventually it began to dawn on them that this is a far better story. That maybe, in fact, God does want for our good. That maybe, in fact, God is going to work through all of the messiness that each of our lives entail bring good out of it. Maybe not now, maybe not before my eyes, maybe not even according to my own judgments. But that's actually what faith involves. The question is, will us new pagans begin to believe? Because I don't see a better story. I think this one is the best. Let's pray. Lord, we see these women coming to the tomb. They were likely there with Jesus on the road when he said to his disciples, the Son of Man will rise three days later. They didn't bring a banner with them. They, bought, they brought embalming spices. And then Jesus just surprises them all. 
And Lord, you keep surprising us. Lord, so often I would like to have the power to just remove the pain, remove the hardship, remove the calamity. And it's often the case, Lord, that something happens and I look at it and say, I can't make any sense of that. But Lord, the cross and the empty tomb together suggest to me that it's best that I keep following you. It's best that I keep trusting you. To either say that the world is just chaos and calamity, that gets me nothing. To believe that somehow, some way, you will redeem this amazing, chaotic, sometimes painful story that is human history and turn it into something glorious that I want to cling to. Lord, give us your spirit and help us to believe. And may we follow this, reason, this risen Jesus wherever he takes us. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?